The citizens of Massachusetts own nearly a half million acres of protected open space, managed on your behalf by the State Department of Conservation and Recreation. We encourage you to experience your park system with family and friends. Hello everybody, I'm Ellen Penniman and I'm with RV New England and we're sitting here today with Priscilla Geigas, the Deputy Commissioner for the Massachusetts Department of Conservation and Recreation. And we're here to talk about RV camping in Massachusetts State Parks. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today and share with everybody who's watching information about how to enjoy RV camping. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here in my hometown of Stoughton, Mass. Yes, absolutely, and we're delighted to have you. Now, one thing you were sharing with me was that you're an RVer. Mm -hmm. I actually grew up, uh, so I grew up in Stoughton, and uh, we moved here in 1970, and actually that was the first year that we went with our tent trailer all uh, on our camping excursions. My, my mom was a school teacher here in Stoughton for 23 years at the Helen Hansen School. My dad was the minister of the first congregational church in Stoughton. Uh, for 25 years and so we took a month off in August and we would just go camping and hiking all across the country so we went to state and national parks with our tent trailer and that really started me on this great adventure of loving the parks and loving camping and I still camp today I don't have a tent trailer but I camp in a tent and uh, but although I'm, I'm kind of eyeing maybe getting an RV I, I have my eye on some things and there are so many possibilities now for RV camping. So it was, a, it was a great experience and I always love to get more people involved in the magic of camping because it really, it, it not only ma makes that connection to the natural, cultural and historic resources, but it's also about connecting families. And I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in today if it weren't for those adventures. So I want other people to have them as well. So just to get us started, what kinds of camping are allowed in Massachusetts State Parks for RVs because there's a lot of different ways to camp in an RV. Mm -hmm. Well, we we really belong, I mean, we have an incredible state. So we have coastal areas such as Salisbury Beach or Scusset Beach or Horseneck Beach. Uh, we have actual hookups, electric hookups and um, water hookups at both Salisbury and Scusset Beach, also at Wampatuck State Park and Hingham. So those are great experiences with those sites. Uh, but we also have RV camping all over. So even though you don't have the hookups, as you know, you can do that dry camping and you can camp at a lot of places across the state. So you can camp in our largest state forest, which is out in October Mountain in the Berkshires, beautiful Berkshires. You can camp at Mohawk State Forest, which has the tallest trees in Massachusetts. You can camp in the middle of the state at Lake Denison if you want to be near a lake or a pond. Uh, there are just, there's such a diversity of experiences from small places to camp to also larger places to camp where there are big, big RVs, you know, the big uh, motorhomes as well as small, you know, tent trailers or, or the teardrops. You've seen yes. those. Everybody's into the small, small houses and, and uh, small campers. So there's a, a real variety of experiences that you can have. Now, you touched on something I did want to ask about because mm -hmm. I know that some national parks will have size restrictions mm -hmm. for some RVs. Now, are there any such restrictions in the Massachusetts state parks? And if someone's planning to RV, do they need to check? Mm -hmm. How does that work for either the very large, you know, Class A motorhomes? So we have, our, our reservation system is with Reserve America, so if you want to make a reservation at a Massachusetts state campground, get on Reserve America. When you get on that site, there is a layout of the campground, and so you can see the loops and you can see the actual sites. And there will be an RV icon on that site, and when you roll over that or you click on that, it will give you the maximum length of a recreation vehicle that can be there. And that is really important for people when you're planning your trip to make sure that you take a look at that because the last thing that we want to happen, have happen is for someone to show up with a large recreational vehicle and then it won't fit in the site. 
So that is, it's very important to do that and you can take a look at those sites. And for people that want a little bit more information or want to talk to someone, we also have a number that you can call for the call center and you can talk through the different sites that are available. So to make sure that your RV is going to actually fit in that site. So that's all over the place in the okay. parks. One of the things you did touch on also was dry camping mm -hmm. is available. Mm -hmm. and. What kind of tips and advice would you have, especially for campers who are new to dry camping, mm -hmm. maybe they're new to camping altogether, or they've always camped um, in traditional sites or campgrounds which have the full hookups? So when we talk about dry camping, that just means that we're, you're we're not going to be able you're not going to be able to hook up to water or to electric and some places may not have a dump station in in some places where we have dry camping we do have dump stations and that's also something that you should look at on that reserve america site so it will tell you all the amenities that are there so sometimes there will be one but if there isn't one you really want to make sure that when you are dry camping you know your water tank is is full you can get you know fresh water you can also um, um, that you're that you know where to um, you know to dump the gray gray water, but in the season, if you are dry camping, the the people that are in the RVs are also have access to the bathrooms that we have there, the comfort stations that have the showers and the bathrooms, and we have uh, dishwashing statement uh, uh, stations, and we also have water that's available for all of the campers. So during the season. We have, uh, even if you're kind of uh, don't have the hookups, you're still able to get those amenities. In the off season, so now we are, most of our campgrounds have closed during Columbus Day is our last weekend, but we do have a couple that are uh, still accepting campers for the next few weeks. And then at Scusset Beach, we have camping all winter long, and that is really truly dry camping. So, you know, we don't have the bathrooms open, the dump station isn't open, so you really need to make sure that you are all self-contained there. Um, that is something that we have on weekends only during the off season, so Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. And we have a lot of people that love to camp there, you know, during the winter. Some people aren't as hardy to camp during the winter, especially during, at, in coastal areas, but we have a uh, you know, wonderful people that love to come back and, and do that. So you just, you just really need to be prepared. Now, what kind of outdoor activities are allowed um, at some of these state parks? Are all of them fishing? Um, I'm not sure about Massachusetts, any hunting during the hunting seasons? Mm -hmm. So one thing I would mention is we have, during our high summer season, we have wonderful interpretive programs. And by that I mean that our park interpreters will make connections between the natural, cultural, and historic resources that we have and our visitors. So we'll have hiking programs and we'll talk about the, the trees that you're seeing, the wildlife that you're seeing, the, the coastal areas and how you know dunes form. We try to teach about the ecology, we also teach about the, the history of that particular park. And it's really all to try to instill that stewardship that we have of our natural um, areas. We will have fire pro, you know, um, fireside programs where we might make a big uh, fire in the pit and maybe we'll do some s'mores at our, at our amphitheaters. We also have nature centers. We have a wonderful junior ranger program so the kids can earn a junior ranger badge when they fulfill a certain number of activities in all of these different areas. So that's one, one uh, activity that we have which is, you know, I used to always go to the ranger talks when I was a kid, and I still do now, so um, at kids at heart do that as well. And uh, so that's, that's wonderful. We also have, you know, bike trails throughout the, the campground, so you can bring a bike, you can go boating, you know, kayaking. In some places you can rent some kayaks. Uh, wildlife spotting, uh, swimming, so there's a variety of different activities and again if you look on the individual sites that would all be listed. Um, you, do, you did mention hunting, we do allow hunting in our state parks during the hunting season and you would, you would just need to check, the, check our website for that availability. Um, one of the other things you touched on and it's something we discussed too is you talked about wildlife spotting. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in some of the more rustic areas or areas where you might be taking a tent camper 
or an RV, or even if you're tent camping, mm -hmm. which is a, a more rustic experience. Um, advice you might want to give um, for people, because you are with other wildlife. Mm -hmm. You're not in an urban or developed area. And some of the, the campsite etiquette mm -hmm. for keeping that in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that I love about camping is being able to see the wildlife. So I was just camping at Wampatuck State Park this past weekend, and the first thing I saw was a deer, and then I saw a turkey. And it's really fun to be able to see the animals in the wild. But they are wild animals, and so you really do need to make sure that you are not tempting them to come into your campsites. You need to make sure that the food that you have is put away. Now, in the western part of the state, in the Berkshires, we actually supply bear lockers. And so we want people to put their food into those big metal containers with heavy doors so that the bears do not go in and, and get the food. Uh, that would be a bad experience on both accounts. So you really want to make sure that you're cleaning up your campsite, you keep your food indoors. Um, if you're in a tent or if you're in a tent trailer, I would advise that the food goes inside your car. Um, also, you know, toiletries that might have a scent to them, those should also be put away and put in your car uh, or, or stored away, you know, in your RV. So you don't want to leave those out. Also, pets, it's important to keep your pets on a leash. You know, we do have a four pet limit, uh, which is a lot, anything that can be caged. So your gerbil is considered a pet if you want to bring your gerbil and your dog and everything. Um, and we welcome that, but we also want to make sure that they stay safe and that they're on a leash and that they're under your control at all times because they can also provoke the wildlife as well. So you just want to be smart about that, and that's the main thing is to keep, keep that away. Also, I would say don't approach the wildlife. Even though some wildlife can become, if you, if you start feeding the wildlife, you may think that it's cute and you want to get the picture with your kid, you know, feeding the squirrel, little Captain Crunch cereal. Don't do it because then they get accustomed to that. And then I think people think that they could approach wildlife. And we've, uh, unfortunately, there have been stories in the nation where people have been approached by wildlife uh, that have gotten too accustomed to that and it's not good for either the animal or for the human. One of the things we also touched on is camping with people who might have special needs mm -hmm. and how that works. So for over 25 years our department has had a, a nationally known universal access program and we specialize in really trying to make sure that our recreational activities are, are accessible to people of all abilities. And this past year, and we're going to be doing this again, this is something that will be reoccurring, we actually did a camping program where we brought people together under our universal access program. People with um, some you know, mobility issues came and camped, and we're gonna be doing that again uh, this year. Uh, that's a specialized program that we do. We have a number of programs in other recreational activities, whether it's um, biking on the Cape Cod Rail Trail or uh, kayaking out on the Connecticut River, and I would urge people to go to our Universal Access website, which is Universal Access page on the DCR website. But also, again, if you look at the characteristics of the facility, it will say, um, you know, accessible bathroom, or when you roll over the sites, that it'll be an accessible site. And so that's really important for people to be looking at that when they're planning as well. Because we really, as I said before, you know, camping is a magical experience. We, we want to make sure that we are accessible to everyone. Of, of all abilities. So you also asked about emergency situations and you know our campgrounds we have 3,500 campsites all across the state so that's a lot of people in our campgrounds especially during the busy, busy summer season so we know that accidents are going to happen, injuries are going to occur um, and if there is an emergency everybody seems to have a cell phone these days and so they're always calling 911 and we have a very close relationship with the local police and also our environmental police who can come out and, uh, and, and address any emergency situations. Our staff is also, you know, uh, available that when they see something that is happening, they can get the emergency personnel in as well. So we do have a procedure for that. So um, people can, can, we want people to have a safe experience. And, and again, if, if injuries occur, 
then we will we will deal with them as quickly and as swiftly as possible to make sure that somebody gets addressed. Now, what about people who, for whatever reason, may be camping alone mm -hmm. and may feel a little vulnerable because they are alone? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, one thing that I would say is, I mean, we have an incredibly dedicated and friendly staff. And if there are people that are camping alone and they have some concerns about that, they might just mention that to the staff. And even though we do patrol around, they might do, you know, put an extra eye on that particular site if, uh, if folks have some concerns about that. Uh, you know, again, I, I think it's it's also a very friendly environment, and I think that other folks are available to be able to help. I mean, one thing that I would also say too is uh, make sure that you have good equipment. And one of the big things is is lighting. You might not think that that's that important, but if you get up in the middle of the night, you really need to have a good flashlight or a lantern to find your way to the comfort station if you're going to be using that. I mean, if you're in a self-contained unit, you you might not. Um, need to do that. But I think that that's also important um, just in terms of, of uh, being able to kind of see the pathways and because we certainly don't want people to be stumbling if they're, you know, hiking at night. Uh, but again, I think that the best thing to do is if people are concerned about that is, you know, obviously have a, have a cell phone so that you're able to call, but also just alert the staff because they, they really want everybody to have a good experience and they can they can do a little bit of an extra look just to make sure that everything's okay and they'll check in with you. If anyone has any questions we haven't covered here, mm -hmm. what are some resources that they can go and find more information? So you can definitely get on to the uh, mass.gov backslash DCR. That's our website and there's a camping page. We are in the process right now of kind of revamping some of the pages. So we're continually to add additional information, but I would say that's a good resource. Um, Reserve America also has some information on that. I also might mention if you're just interested in getting into RVing and you really want to see what's out there, there is an RV show that's coming up in Boston in January. And, you know, I for one love to go and just see what the newest technology is and you can ask some questions. The other thing I wanted to just mention is if you're thinking about camping and you don't really want to make the investment in an RV yet, but you just want to try it out. We also have what we yurts and mm -hmm. cabins available for rent. And that is an easy way to get people into camping. So you just bring your sleeping bag and you bring your lantern and your food and your, you know, stove and and it's a great experience. So you haven't made that that complete investment, but you've tried it out because there is something, as I say, I, I keep on using the word magical, but it really is. There's something really great about being at a place at night and hearing the rustle of the trees. And, you know, I heard an owl the other night when I was at Wampatuck and that, and that is really exciting. It can also be a little scary depending on what kind of <laughs> owl it is, but it was, it's, it's really neat. And, um, just being in a cabin or a yurt is an opportunity to get out to camp without buying a lot of gear, but being able to have that experience, you know, having your flashlight and going on an adventure to, to you know, go on the trails or to, to go to the comfort station, even, you know, eating outside, cooking outside, cooking at a picnic table. I mean, that's really, it's really neat. And so, and there's a lot of information on the website. I mean, if you Google camping, I mean, great. I would also encourage people to, to, to think outside the box when you're cooking for recipes. You know, it's not just hamburgers and hot dogs, right? We made a wonderful peach cobbler in the Dutch oven this weekend. It was really great. Um, we'll do a little stir fry in the camp stove. And of course you're making s'mores, right? Well, yes. <laughs> so one thing I wanna ask about, and it's a topic near and dear to my heart, for all of my friends who have the grown-up toys, what about big boy toys, big girl toys, like motorcycles, dirt bikes, ATVs, things like that that people want, might want to bring to a state park. Mm -hmm. Well, in terms of camping and, uh, and ATVs, we do have a few campgrounds that 
also have ATV trails. So ATVs are allowed on state park properties in designated areas. So for example, Beartown, Pittsfield, and October Mountain, they all have campgrounds and they also have ATV trails. So that's a popular place for that. Uh, the, the dirt bikes um, are only allowed in places uh, in, the south, in the south region, but those are day-use facilities, so we don't have campgrounds that would, that would allow that. So you just really need to check, again, the website beforehand. People bring boats. Um, that's another uh, big, big person toy, and people bring boats and, and have trailers, and you can do that. With, you know, Salisbury has a, uh, has a boat ramp that you can use. Uh, people are also bringing canoes and kayaks, and so there's a lot of activities. You know, paddle boarding has really become uh, very popular as well, and I think of that as a, a big adult toy as well. So uh, people are bringing all types of recreational activities, but I just it's very important for people to check our website in advance just to make sure that those uh, that those are available and that they're allowed on the property. Good to know. <laughs> for, the, for those of us who want to take our toys. That's right. You brought some pictures for us. I did. I, uh, my sister might kill me for showing these pictures, but I have a couple of pictures that are from our early camping days. One is of us standing outside the Apache tent trailer. I don't know if Apache is in business anymore, but that was a tent trailer that we had actually borrowed from friends of ours who had gotten my parents into camping. I mean, they had never gone camping as kids, my parents, but they just really wanted to see the nation with their two daughters, and so they borrowed a tent trailer to test it out. We went out to Mohawk State Forest, and uh, kind of a funny story about that, that, you know, that's right on the Mohawk Trail. So there is a Native American statue called Hail to the Sunrise, and the, and the you know, uh, his arms are, are outstretched. So as a little kid, I was five years old, I had my arms outstretched, and I thought that was really cool. And then that night, it actually hailed in, you know, it hailed on our tent trailer. And so my famous line in kind of the Geigas lore is, when will the tent wreck? Because I asked my parents, you know, we're all there <laughs> sleeping, and I'm saying, when will the tent wreck? Because it was hailing, and I honestly thought that the hail resulted from my putting my arms up right in front of that Native American statue right on the Mohawk Trail. But we were bitten by the camping bug. We loved it. And so we then bought a tent trailer. We called it Coxie. It was a Cox tent trailer, and that traveled all over the nation. We even brought it to Alaska. We drove the Alaska Highway. So this is a picture of us sitting outside. Uh, we were a little bit older with, uh, with Coxie, the tent trailer, and we, we uh, made tuna fish sandwiches on the side of the road. Trying to, My dad would drive these incredibly long driving days, 500 miles. He would drive in a day. We would do our journals in the back and our little samplers and, and write postcards. And I still have my journals. And uh, it's, it's really fun to just see the handwriting and to see where we went. And uh, that was great. I guess that's, that's what happens when you have a teacher as a mom who's, who's always having you learn. And so uh, mm -hmm. I really, I, I'm very blessed to have had that experience growing up. That's the greatest gift my parents could give us. And uh, my sister has been a travel writer. So here I am in, in parks, and my sister's a travel writer. So it's great. Those are such good stories. <laughs> You're going to come back and see me again, right? Absolutely. We're going to do some cooking together. Yes, because <laughs> we are going to, to let people know that you can be an RVer and you can be a foodie all at the same time. Absolutely. Well, this has been great fun. Well, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time. So have you. It's been great. Always a pleasure to come back to Stoughton. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and Stoughton's happy to have you back. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.